spinning around like a ball or a top or something. It's a much more complicated concept. But if I sort of think of it as spin, it's sort of like the spin spins 360 degrees over in the complex plane, then spins 360 degrees in three space, real space. Well, while it's over spinning in the uh, 360 over in the time domain, it can absorb energy coming in in the fourth axis because the charge is looking over there and it's open to the receipt of energy from that domain. Then when it starts to rotate, or so to speak, in, in three dimensions over in real space, it's already excited by this time energy, the energy it received in the time domain. So it is decaying now. It is putting out the energy, emitting the energy. It absorbs in the time domain, emits in the uh, three space. In fact, it emits longitudinal waves. Now, I can find very powerful support for that in uh, two other areas. One is uh, particle physics and one is quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, for example, <clears throat> Mandel and Shaw in their standard uh, textbook, uh, Quantum Field Theory, Wiley, 1984, Chapter 5, they very strongly look at a very similar problem. They look at the longitudinal photon and the scalar photon, which is a time polarized photon. The energy is over there oscillating on the time axis. Okay, so what we have is we have a very strong argument <clears throat> that neither the scalar photon, that is the time polarized photon, nor the longitudinal photon, which is over in three space, are individually observable. But if you somehow can combine the two, they are observable as the instantaneous quantum potential. Nice, because if I go back to uh, Whitaker 1903, his decomposition of the scalar potential into bidirectional longitudinal waves, Whitaker made an error in his, uh, in his uh, interpretation. It's a standard area made throughout most of U1 electrodynamics. They interpret the wave after it's interacted with the charge, in other words, what's diverted from the wave by the charge. They don't ever specify the wave in space, or the photon in space, or the energy in space. They always do the thing after it interacts. Now, if you go back before it interacts, you had to have something causing this interaction. That's in the fourth space, because you get three space after you have observation. You have a partial with respect to T to tear off the time and leave your frozen snapshot, and that's what you see, the effect. Anyway, they argue very powerfully that this combination of these two give you the instantaneous uh, quantum potential. And if I reinterpret Whitaker's decomposition to straighten out the fact that he had two effects rather than a cause and effect, his input phase conjugate wave actually is a time polarized wave, which means it now agrees with the same thing from quantum field theory, from, uh, excuse me, particle physics. Uh, and, and, and quantum field theory. Now, in particle physics, we have the fact that with the award of the Nobel Prize, any dipole is known to have uh, to be a broken symmetry in the active exchange with the vacuum. The very definition of broken symmetry means that some conservation law there in that exchange area has been violated. That's what broken symmetry means. So what it means is if I have energy coming in in the time domain, it means that it's not flowing back out in the time domain, and it's flowing out in the uh, space, free space domain, and that uh, is exactly what's happening over in the other ways of looking at it. So we have an agreement between quantum field theory, between my interpretation of uh, reinterpretation, I should say reinterpretation of Whitaker's profound decomposition of the scalar potential in 1903, and... Uh, quantum field theory. We have an agreement between three major things. So that's pretty solid. So we can state now that all EM energy in three space first enters there on the source charges. It first enters there from the time domain. Basically, any three space EM energy we're looking at, we have converted a little time into that. Now, how powerful is time energy? Let me give you a little experiment to think of in your head, a little thought experiment. Suppose uh, that I have a, I have some spatial energy, electromagnetic energy in space. And suppose I reach in here and I compress this by the factor C squared. I'm in three dimensions now. I've compressed this down to a very dense energy in three dimensions. What can I do with this? Well, I can leave it right where it is, in which case it's known as mass. That's E equal MC squared, standard thing, familiar to everybody, no big problem. Everybody can get their mind a hold of that. But I don't have to leave it in three dimensions. If I pick this thing up and I put it over in a time domain, what I've really done is change the photon oscillations from, uh, from uh, uh, lateral in three space to lateral over there along the time axis. 
So I have a longitudinal wave in a time domain, and it becomes what we call time. So time itself is pure energy, and it, in fact, has the same energy density as mass. It's very powerful energy. If you want to deal with powerful energy in the photon, you don't deal with a spatial energy component, delta E. You deal with delta T, because